I'd like to begin tonight with the following land acknowledgement. I am a grateful but uninvited visitor to the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, past and present, including the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations and the Duwamish peoples. I acknowledge the land on which I live, learn, and practice as Coast Salish land, and I recognize this land acknowledgement to be one small act in an ongoing process of understanding and opposing the systematic oppression and historic and contemporary erasure of indigeneity and indigenous peoples. We are on stolen land. Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Yvette Moy, and I'm the University of Washington's Director of Public Lectures. And I want to thank you all so much for braving the fall evening to come out and spend it with us here on campus tonight. And it is my great pleasure to welcome director, actor, screenwriter, and so much more, Boots Riley, to campus. We're also going to welcome this evening's moderator, UW's very own Dr. Golden Owens. And before we get started, we have a few people we want to thank. I want to extend a very big thank you to the Department of Cinema and Media Studies. They were our co-hosts in bringing the speaker. Thank you. That's right. Go ahead. You can raise your hands. There we go. Show some love. That's right. Show some love. Show some love. We like that. Um, and then I have a few housekeeping items to go through. So um, if you haven't done so already, could you please take your cell phones out and turn them to silent or just turn them off? Like, we don't need to take any phone calls right now. Um, we ask that you refrain from taking any video or audio recordings of this evening's lecture. We are video recording it, and it will be posted in about 24, well, actually, no, Monday it should go up, Monday or Tuesday. It'll be up on the Office of Public Lectures um, page. I see a hand out there. Yes, how can I help you? Oh, you're looking for your friends. They're your friends over there. <laughs> right over there. Uh, <laughs> We also ask that you refrain from taking photographs um, while our lecturer is speaking. Um, we will have our two student assistants who are taking photos at the very beginning and at the very end um, who are doing it for social media. So please be comfortable with that. Um, this evening's Q&A, you, you have two options. We have um, the QR code right here where you can use Slido um, to email a question in um, for submitting a question. Or you could meet us at one of the microphones, and we will do our best to get through all the questions as we can tonight. Um, afterwards, um, we, there is a, a quick photo opportunity. Um, if, you want, want, if you want to hang out and get your photo taken with Boots, he's uh, graciously agreed to spend some time with us a little more after the lecture tonight. And then finally, um, introducing tonight's guest will be UW's Associate Chair of Cinema and Media Studies, Dr. Stephen Greening. Wait, wait, wait. But as we do a little church, I know, we love that guy. Um, and as we do, he has great hair, doesn't he? Um, but as we do, as we welcome people onto the stage, we ask everybody to take a moment to introduce yourself to your neighbor and say hi and make a new friend tonight. So please do that. Thank you. All right, sorry, I forgot about that part. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you all for coming. Howdy neighbor. My name is Stephen Greening. I'm the Associate Chair of the Cinema and Media Studies Department here at the University of Washington. We are a small department with fewer than 10 full-time faculty, but we have well over 200 majors and over 300 uh, grad, 30 graduate students, 300, wow, we're not that busy. Um, so we're a, we're a small department that does outsized things like this. Um, I'm super excited about tonight. I'm, I can't even tell you uh, how long it's been um, since I've wanted to have Boots Riley uh, visit Seattle and um, talk to us about his work. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, read the introduction so we can get to it and hear from him because you don't need to hear from me. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's guest, Boots Riley, who is a director, activist, screenwriter, producer, poet, rapper, and speaker. His directorial debut film, Sorry to Bother You, premiered to strong critical acclaim at the Sundance Film Festival. 
By embedding messages regarding economic and class critique, as well as politically progressive movement building into dystopian science fiction satire, Sorry to Bother You brought issues surrounding income inequality into wide public discussion in the United States and abroad. His 2023 seven-part series, Absurdist Comedy, I'm a Virgo, features a 13-foot-tall black man who lives in Oakland, California, and includes Emmy Award-winning actor Jarell Jerome, along with Mike Epps, Carmen Ajogo, Kara Young, and many others. A dedicated community-based activist, Mr. Riley was deeply involved with the Occupy Oakland movement and was one of the leaders of the activist group, The Young Comrades. He is also the founding member and lead vocalist of The Coup and Street Sweeper Social Club, featuring Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine. He is the author of the critically acclaimed collection of essays, Tell Homeland Security, We Are the Bomb. Tonight's moderator is University of Washington's assistant professor in the Cinema and Media Studies Department, Dr. Golden Owens. Dr. Owens researches and teaches about race and representation, artificial intelligence, haunting, popular culture, and racialized sounds and voices. Her current book project examines intelligent virtual assistants and platforms such as Amazon's Alexa. I'm waiting for the beep as soon as I say Alexa. Apple's Siri and ChatGPT contending that these aids evoke and are haunted by black women slaves, servants, and houseworkers in the United States. Her project demonstrates this haunting through analyzing popular 20th and 21st century media depictions of black female domestic workers, robotic and or artificially intelligent servants and helpers, labor-saving products and devices, and contemporary virtual aids. Dr. Owen's work appears in Sounding Out and has been accepted by the Journal for Cinema Media Studies. Her research has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, the Social Science Research Council, the Mellon Foundation, Northwestern University's Office of Fellowships, the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, and the Walter Chapin Simpson Center for the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Boots Riley and Dr. Golden Owens to the stage. What's up? What's up? All right. How you feeling? Good. Good. It seems like everybody's ready to party. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like it. We've got a got a great audience for a party yeah. today. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, thank you for being here. I mean, we've been in conversation throughout the day, but I'm excited to talk to you. We're all excited to have you here. So thanks for your presence. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a little while since I've been in Seattle. So yeah. um, I think the last last time we were here was like the crocodile or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a few people remember, nice. <laughs> well, my first question for you goes into thinking about the ways that you were described in your introduction. You know, director, product producer, activist, etc. These are all things that sort of get used to describe you. How would you describe yourself? Yeah, I guess uh, someone that wants to see a world where the people democratically control the wealth that we create with our labor. Mm. Um, that's one way, another way is a communist, another way is an artist, um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, well you got into a lot of that stuff at an early age, you know, you mentioned in, uh, early, you've mentioned in interviews before that when you were five, your dad came home from fighting the Klan and you, seeing that he did something that was illegal but morally right was something that made you start thinking about the difference between what's legal and what's moral. Can you talk more about those differences and why it's so important to mine the difference between the legal and the moral? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, so much of what's taught to us is in this framework of what's legal. I, I think maybe when I was talking about that, uh, that more was the discussion, because I think I was talking about that at around the time that Occupy was going on, and there were all these questions about what was legal about it and things like that. Um, I think uh, right now we understand um, that those legalities only 
exist uh, for those of us that, that don't have power, I'll say, for the working class, let's say, right? Uh, for, uh, because it really, something legal or illegal, moral or immoral, uh, actually, uh, there is no connection. And furthermore, even if something is illegal, if uh, those in power are doing it, it really doesn't matter, as we see with all of the uh, international laws being broken by Israel during the genocide they're committing <laughs> against Gaza. You know, as a matter of fact, many of us have a lot of hope in what the UN might be able to do. Like, oh, they're gonna go on trial for war crimes. I even myself have said that publicly. But the truth is, you know, what's being shown is, is that it's power that matters and the, the UN only has the power that the US gives it. Because we are, you know, be, because, you know, war crime after war crime is happening and there is nobody to save us. There's nobody to save the world. We're the only ones that can do it. You know, there's, it's not gonna, it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not gonna happen because somebody, you know, the, the few people see something wrong that's going on and they put somebody on, on trial, that's not gonna stop it. And even if they do go to jail after killing, you know, however many hundreds of thousands of people it ends up being, who cares, right? Whether they go to jail or not, hopefully they do, but that doesn't stop it. The thing that would stop it is if we had a, uh, if, if, if we had a, a radical movement that had enough ties to the working class to where we could shut down industry and demand the policy that we want, um, we don't have that yet. We don't have that power, and power is the only thing that will change it. It's not really what's legal or even what's moral. Hopefully, if the working class have, has power, then we are uh, pushing forward towards what's right and what's moral. But those questions um, in this right now in this context are not necessarily the que the question that I was answering when I said that was a was about Occupy and it being accused of doing illegal things and things like that. But when we're talking about the question of legality right now and how it's being talked about and people debating whether this is le whether what 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 the U.S. is enabling, what the U.S. is funding, what the U.S. is directing, basically is legal or not, um, it's really just a question of power. Mm. And we, we need to build movements that utilize the power that the working class has. How do we start to build that power? Um, well, since I have all the answers, um, <laughs> What, what I think we need to do is, you know, when, when I look at other revolutions that happen, not only when I look at it, but when, when other revolutions have happened, even ones that people, you know, whether you, you like what ended up happening afterward or whether you agree with it or not, um, it wasn't just a group of people getting fed up and changing it. You could condense it down to that, but Usually what was happening is the, the, the working class got radicalized through struggles around things that they could control. And in that case, and it wasn't just uh, asking for reforms or showing that they were fed up, it was through strikes and work stoppages. And uh, oftentimes getting uh, to places where segments of industry were being shut down, even in places like Cuba, where we usually talk about it in terms of Fidel and Che came through and then they made the revolution happen. There were general strikes happening at the time and that revolution wouldn't have happened without those things. 
So I think that what we need to do is further what is happening now. Over the past handful of years, uh, there have been, and I lost count now, but a couple, a, you know, since 2020, there have been at least 3,000 strikes and work stoppages in the United States. And, um, and again, that count is from a couple years ago, so I'm sure there's, there's more now. Um, and it's not often talked about in, in the total context, but what's happening is people are looking for ways to control the world around them. And they're looking for an analysis, and not only an analysis, but an organization that can affect that analysis that, 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 that talks about that. So um, people are using the withholding of labor uh, as, a, as a strategy to get things. And sometimes it's uh, for, for wage increases, sometimes it's for uh, you know, more radical uh, things that, that we would have thought of as radical 10, 15 years ago, but demanding certain things. Now, uh, I mean, if you look at the writer's strike, a bunch of Hollywood people who are very invested, if you want to say in terms of compared to the working class, in an industry that is, uh, that, that, that I don't think anyone would think of as, uh, as, uh, being the, the, the helm, the, the cutting edge of radical activity. But even then, people went on strike, and one of the main goals was to stop the pervasiveness of AI in general. Like the idea that we're told what, that, that technology is just happening, we have no control over it, it's happening, it's gonna change your life in this way. Complain about it, write a blog about it, make a speech about it, make a movie about it but it's happening, right? And every technology gets put on, upon us, like, hey, you're not gonna like this, but we're about to surveil every one of you. We know it's not what you, not, it's not, wouldn't be in your druthers, but it's happening. We're just, it's just rolled out. It was a really big stance to be like, we're not letting this happen. And to the point where um, a, a large group of writers that were also directors went to the DGA, who was not taking a stand on it, and forced them to take a stand on it, right? Um, so what I'm saying is, but, but that was with people in, a, in an industry where, okay, you're not getting hired because I don't like you, that sort of thing happens. So that was a big stance for people to take. What I'm saying is, is that there's already this thing happening where people are, where, where people are looking to take these stances to, to, to affect power uh, by organizing on the job. And what we need to do is create a mass militant radical labor movement that uses, uh, that, that uses the withholding of labor as a strategy and tactic uh, to change, first change policy and living conditions and eventually grow into a larger radical movement that can change the very nature of society. Mm. I'll give you a little bit of a break from asking me for all the answers <laughs> to all of the world's questions and sort of bridge between your activism, which really encompasses a lot of these things that you've been discussing with your art because a lot of your artwork contains a lot of these political ideas, these communist ideas. And I want to talk to you about why it's so important to combine activism with art and the ways that they're always already connected. So why is it important for you to combine them and how are they always already in conversation with each other? Well, art is just communication. It's just where, our, I mean, talking is an art, like, it, you know, if you, if you do it right, you're thinking about how to best communicate this to the other person, you're listening to the other person, you're responding to them. It's, it, it's, it's an art. Um, that's one that everybody does all the time. Um, you know, uh, when people make music or make visual art, often they're attempting to communicate things 
that words aren't, don't suffice for those, the emotions, uh, thing, the, the thoughts in between the words, the feelings, and that's part of the communication. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's also, you know, the, 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 the art uh, the, the being just communication is also kind of uh, recognizing that we're here right now. We're here in this moment, I'm so sounding very hippie, but um, you know, we're, we're, it's something that, that, that allows us to be together, to witness something. And, um, and so all of that, to me, you know, I, I think everyone should be an artist. I think everyone should communicate these things, their ideas about the world. And, and hopefully, you know, wish we had a world where everyone had time to do these things. And, um, you know, but so if I'm going to communicate, I'm going to communicate what I think. And I also uh, think that, that, that uh, certain forms of communication um, are, you know, are, it, it's just uh, effective for getting across these big ideas. You know, if I make a movie, I'm taking people through an experience. You know, with, with music, it's, the music is playing, you listen to it, you think about it, maybe, uh, but, but you also, throughout your life, for 20 years, you might play that song. And it's in the background while you're doing things, it colors your life, it changes how you think about what's happening right there in some way. Um, and uh, that, that has an effect in one way, but with movies, uh, I can you take people through an experience, and in, as far as their brain is concerned, they went through that experience, right? They they had that, and often what organizers are trying to do, for instance, if if someone is uh, a radical organizer that happens that that is working, organizing on the job, one of the reasons that you might take someone through a labor struggle, take a group of people through a labor struggle is. Uh, is the, the, the fact that the experiences they have there help them to understand how the world works. They, instead of police being an abstract, they see the police protect the boss. They think about, they understand what side of the, the struggle they're on. And they have a, you know, they have the, that experience changes how they view the world. And so with, with art, I'm, 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 that's what's happening to people, not just with my art, with everyone's art. They're going through this experience, and because I have a view of the world, I'm pointing at things that are often left out mm. of other pieces of art, right? Like, Sorry to Bother You is an office place, is a workplace comedy. <laughs> and. I mean, how many workplace comedies are there? Probably hundreds, you know, of workplace comedies. And how many of them have any class struggle in it? All of them have something where they hate the manager. <laughs> Most of them. But if you were to watch them, you would think that that struggle doesn't exist. So that when you see it in real life, you think, wow, this is this thing over here that doesn't, you know, it's it so, so much of, so, so, you know, so class struggle is left out of the existence that we are brought through. Mm. When we are spending so much of our lives now watching movies, watching TV shows, and it really exists in real life. It exists in those spaces. It happens in those spaces in real life. And so it affects how we engage with those things in real life. So art is a, is a big part of how we know ourselves, how we, what we think of our, you know, what, what, what we think about the world around us. You see a bunch of, if you see a bunch of racist uh, ideas in the art that you see, you start think, you start 
uh, assessing your life in that way too, right? You start, uh, and, and so it changes that. So all this stuff we're taking in is, is affecting it. So um, I think that, you know, so, so I'm just trying to have a, a, a you know, have a different analysis in there. And hopefully an analysis that doesn't just lead one to an analysis of what's wrong, but one that says that you can leave the theater and do something and mm -hmm. join an organization. You know, not just the, oh, one voice or raise your voice, but just like, you know, actually join an organization that is working on these fronts, join it, wh whether it's, you know, um, just organizing on the job, whether it's a, a larger radical organization or a party that is looking to uh, make those things happen. Mm. You've mentioned something about Sorry to Bother You in there and talking about it being a workplace comedy and how it's a workplace comedy that doesn't include any class struggle. And it made me think of something well, it is, it does include. That does, it, right, yeah, how yeah. others don't include class yeah, yeah. struggle, but Sorry to Bother You does. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned in the past that you're attracted to contradiction. And I was thinking about that idea of the contradiction of a workplace comedy that doesn't include class struggle, which is what you're fixing with Sorry to Bother You. Is that some of the type of contradiction that you think about when you are approaching your work? It's usually a lot more petty than that. Mm. It's, <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah, I, I think about the things that we can touch and feel and how that expands to, you know, what, what's around us. So, or, you know, it's just a little more, I, I take it from a simpler beat and think about how that's connected. So, you know, and, and sometimes it's just, you know, uh, it, it, so for instance, with I'm a Virgo, I just was like, okay, for some reason, you know, I thought about, okay, giant black man. I was like, well, why is that, what's, why is that interesting to me? What's mm -hmm. funny or, weird about that why and so I was like okay the last thing that you that if you see it, 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 if you talk about a story with a giant black man going down the street the last thing anyone cares about is what he thinks about himself and so that was kind of the, where the story grew from mm. and um, you know so it's, it's things like that and, and, and I end up just trusting that if I'm making art that really is connected to how I see the world, what I think about the world, that those larger ideas about how the world works are, is go are gonna get in there, right? So, you know, for instance, like a, a love song often, you know, there, there's a certain way to write a love song to where people recognize it as a love song you know it's like I love you do you love me how long are you gonna love me do you really love someone else you know there's a certain set group of things in there and it and it, and it might not really be what you your engagement with that right because and it's hard to even think about your engagement in life around those things because so much of our the way we think about the world the way we think about love is from the art that we see from the explanations of life we've seen from movies from songs from things like that so it takes like thinking about your world and thinking about that to think about other things and so from that I made a song called I just want to lay around all day in bed with you and it's really about all the other things that come into play with that and, and, and ends up being about exploitation and labor, right? Ab about those things because it was just me connecting with, okay, I think this and then why do I think that? And then what's, you know, so I'm, it, I start with something small and it gets to something, it, it, it's gonna eventually like, 
connect to all the other things that I believe. Mm. Is that how it was when you were working with, when you were starting the coup and starting to think about how you were, no, how I you think, wanted to do music? I think early on we were just making pamphlets on hate, you mm. know. <laughs> you know, I think that was just like, I did, did not understand that. I think it was just more like, I wanted to get these words out there that said that there was this thing. And I also wanted to create the idea, like, because I, I joined Progressive Labor Party when I was 14, and this was 1980, I, I was turning 15, so it was 86. And I got involved with uh, farm workers movements in Central California, and I, I was hearing all of these stories and all these things about what I now know felt a lot bigger in the stories than they actually were, but I got excited about that so that when I was making music, I was like, I need to make something that feels like there's this compelling movement to join. Mm. Because at the time, I'm 14 and most of the people in the, those organizations were like 30 and late 20, they were old, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, like, it was to the point, you know, and you're a teenager and you're like, you know, please don't come over to the corner where I'm selling papers or passing out flyers. Just stay over there. Let me talk to people. You know, I don't want people to see me be uncool with this 28-year-old. But, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and so I was always thinking about how, you know, thinking about how to make it compelling. And I, early on, was thinking about the feeling that I was getting from music and what that feeling was, what that feeling, which, which felt powerful. Like if I you listen to NWA or other things that would be called gangster rap, what you really connect, not you, I don't know, but what peop, many people are connecting, were connecting to was this feeling that here is someone without shackles on them. That's mm. what it felt like. Here is someone able to do whatever they want to do. And that was, and at, at a time, for us in the 80s, it wasn't like we were in Oakland and we didn't know who the Black Panther Party was. Because mm. there was a thing, like when I, I got uh, red baited when I was in high school and the principal um, said over the loudspeaker, uh, don't listen to Raymond Riley, he's a communist, he wants to bring us back to the days of the Black Panther Party. Mm. And so I had to look up the Black Panther Party. Mm. <laughs> and everybody, people were coming in, and people in class, kids asked the teacher, like, what, who, what's the Black Panther Party? I mean, mm. this is a, Black, uh, like mainly black and Asian school, right? And again, it's only a few years after there, but for us, if you're 15, you know, even four years is a long time, right? Um, so, you know, and, and the teacher said the Black Panther Party, they were like a black version of the Ku Klux Klan. That's mm. what, you know. Wow. And, and so, I had to look it up, and I, I mean, I was connected with uh, radicals, so I was also asking them, what, what is this, what, are, you know? So I, I got, a, and so I had to do a lot of, you know, telling people that, no, this is what that is, blah, blah, blah. So I was always trying to connect the culture that we were, that I was involved in to the feelings that I got when hearing these stories or when being involved in, like, you know, when I went and helped, uh, when, when I went and supported, like, uh, the organizing a farm workers uh, union in McFarland and Delano, um, just seemed so exciting and there were people, it was actually people who had, who were students in, uh, that, that, that fled the 68 massacre in Mexico City. And they came, they had come up um, 
and wanted to join something radical, so they joined, uh, they had joined Cesar Chavez's movement and then realized he was not radical at all. And then they broke off, taking some of those folks with them and created this thing called the Anti-Racist Farm Workers Union. And so, uh, and, and then they connected with PLP, right? And so there was this thing where they really were like, we're gonna organize the valley and then this, we're gonna go here. You know, they had an idea of what, what how, how a revolution could happen. And that was what, and it seemed exciting, it seemed powerful, and I saw that same thing happening when we would listen to, you know, uh, uh, when we would hear Cool G Rap or, or uh, NWA or whatever, there was that same, yearning for something and and that was the most that people got like that was the the only movement that they saw so they're connecting with that mm. and the, the idea that being a dope dealer was somehow somehow d having some power right or being connected with them or whatever so i was wanting to take that and do that and i think early on we i was doing it in very broad ways that um, in some ways were effective, but other ways were not. So it was. Mm -hmm. When did you start getting less broad? Well, I don't know if it was less broad. It was just more about other things. I think um, one one thing that happened was so we on our first album we have a song called uh, "Fuck a Perm," <laughs> and. Um, and it was a result of me like getting teased for my hair and stuff. And at the time, I was at San Francisco State, which had uh, a very, um, I don't know, I guess a very cultural nationalist aspect to some of the politics there among the students. And I definitely was affected by some of that. And so I really wanted to make a song about hair and so I made this song, Fuck a Perm, that was kind of in response to that. And it was a funny song, it was a verse that I liked. And uh, so at every show though, how we would do it is, you know, I, it, cause having an Afro at the time was like, what the fuck are you doing, right? And, um, and at every show we'd perform and we'd wait for the inevitable time, cause we were doing shows opening up for other people all around the country. And we wait for the inevitable time to where somebody said, what the fuck are you doing with your hair, you know, mm. right? And so Pam would have the record ready. She said, what did you say? <laughs> and then we'd go into it and it ends with, you know, so I say, fuck a perm and you know, and the crowd laughs and it's blah, blah, blah. And it always, and we win them over with that. And so we're doing this all over. We got to, to, to Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee in 1993, the style was like Oakland in, in 1982, right? So everybody had curls and straight perms and uh, bomber jackets, right? Mm -hmm. And so we get there and we're opening up for this dude, I think his name was Reality. And, um, and we see the crowd all the curls and perms, and E-Rock leans over to me and says, whatever you do, do not do fuck a perm. <laughs> do not do fuck a perm, right? <laughs> and so even though the same thing did happen, what the fuck is going on with the hair, we did not do it. <laughs> and, and so we go out in the parking lot and sign an autographs and stuff, and then a, a car pulls up with a bunch of dudes with curls, and stuff and they're blasting the album <laughs> and they say hey Coop because a lot of people think that that's my name is Coop <laughs> and they're like hey Coop fuck a perm fuck you <laughs> and I'm like what and then they they kept like circling around saying fuck a perm fuck you right and and we were hanging with reality, who were some, who were at the time some dudes that had a lot of connections. So they were like, 
around us or whatever. We were going club to club with them that night and doing stuff in the same car was at everything coming to blasting the album. They were blasting the album and they're doing they're bumping their head to it too. But every time, you know, uh, they'd catch my eye, they'd be like, fuck a perm, fuck you. <laughs> and it was then that I really changed a lot about what I thought I needed to do because I think the uh, I had been affected by that politic that was happening in colleges at the time, which was that was more that 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 was sort of uh, a thing that just kind of had this idea that people need to change their culture and that's the main thing that happened. Even though I didn't actually believe that there was there were things to my art that 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 were remnants of those ideas. And right then I was like, wow, you know, here's some folks. They obviously love the album. <laughs> and there is, cause that wasn't like a, it wasn't on, on the, it wasn't on the, 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 any video or anything like that. And, but they feel hurt and disconnected from the ideas based on something that I don't think is a primary concern. I mm. do, you know. <laughs> and I don't think, and, and it's not that, you know, we won't change how we act and how we are based on if we feel that we have, if, if we're in a movement where we feel like we have some, are able to exert some control over our surroundings. But, you know, that part has to come first. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, after that album, I, I, I made a, you know, I think early on there was like certain kinds of virtue signaling on that first album that um, was about like, here's what kind of group we are. Mm. This is how we're different than these other groups and, you know, making, you know, and which was, you know, and I'm not saying it lacked anything valuable, but there was something happening there that we didn't go too deep into, but I think luckily I pulled back after that experience and that was very connected to, you know, what happened with, uh, with um, genocide and Jews. Um, and, and also it was different, you know, I had been contacted by TVT Records to make music for uh, Gil Scott Heron for what became the Spirit album. And uh, he didn't show up in the studio. So I had a bunch of music and that became Genocide and Juice. Mm. And, um, and, and it was maybe because of those combinations, like a, a direction that I wouldn't have gone in, but that with this sort of new way of thinking, I, I, I looked at and, and um, you know, really changed things. And, and, and I think also, um, you know, kind of leaning more into like what I thought I was making a connection with, uh, you know, with our first album, a lot of people would come up to us that were like, man, you know, uh, you know, that were, were thought of as gangster rap, that were making music that, you know, espoused ideas that I didn't agree with. And, and they thought they were doing what, what we were doing. Mm. You know, they, and they're like, yeah, we gotta drop that science. So, people that are making songs that are like, here's how you cook cocaine and make money. They actually think, feel that they are doing a community service. Mm. <laughs> because what other movement is out there that is, because especially at the time, and even now sometimes what gets espoused is this sort of, um, that, that, Radical movements are about sort of a, a more moral way of being, which may be true, but losing the idea that really this is about paying your bills. Maybe it's not paying your bills, about not having to pay your bills mm -hmm. and not having to do those things. And we lost a lot of that. 
And partly what was happening then was as a result of the McCarthy era, like all of a sudden people stayed away from talking about certain things that made them look communist or socialist. And so you had a bunch of people that were, you know, now progressive, but talking about, oh, we gotta fight poverty by teaching people how to do interviews. And we gotta fight poverty by, you know, teaching people to have pride, right? Things like that. And this was like what was connected to, and a lot of people that were otherwise radical, that's where you get a job, mm -hmm. right? And that job is guided by whoever is funding it and the parameters of that. So it was a lot of that was mixed up and a lot of that, so, so when people were like, okay, this is how you get out of poverty and I'm, I'm doing a community service in this way. And so understanding that aspect a lot more, I think changed my, uh, changed my approach to the art I was making. Mm. Speaking of the art that you've made, I wanna pivot a little bit to talk about some of your visual media as well. And specifically in thinking about the ways that you bend genre in your visual media, which is also something that you've done in your music because it's rap, but it includes so many different influences from so many different black musical stylings. What is it about, hmm, I'm gonna phrase that differently. Why are you attracted to bending of genres in your work? Good question, I don't know, I, I think, so one, I try not to think about it too hard because I have this sort of feeling like when you get too in your head about it, like I think it's worth talking about it, but me as an artist, sometimes I feel like I'm hurting myself because when you get too in your head about it, then you, uh, then, then you lose track of what that feeling is and you wanna say proclamations about what you're doing and then you want to stick to those proclamations and you know, and so, I mean, I, I think it's a helpful discourse to have in, in public, but I, I, so that's one thing, but I will engage with that. I think, you know, um, I, ha if I were to be, you know, just think about my personal life with it, I think, um, you know, uh, I moved around a lot and was in a lot of different circles as I grew up. You know, I lived in, we, we lived in East Oakland, uh, we lived in West Oakland, and, you know, and, you know, definitely were, was listening to, you know, Rick James and whatever was the black uh, popular music at the time. And then I think when I got to junior high school, we had moved to Pasadena for a couple years, and um, and and that's when I was listening to like the '80s British New Wave stuff, uh, you know, and uh, calling calling ourselves mods and but not riding Vespas, <laughs> like <a> Suzuki FA50, <laughs> um, and listening to that stuff and um, and then moved back to Oakland where that definitely was not cool to have even listened to ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and you know, um, and then having a, a, a mother who was very into, you know, like Fela and, you know, whatever was it, reggae at the time and different stuff and having that around and, my mother dated a lot of musicians. And so there were always different kinds of jazz, you know, this and that um, coming around. So there, uh, these things that I also, you hear them, but they're not, you're like, that's, that's not this, this is not what I, w that's, that's not my generation. You know they exist, but they sound like your parents' stuff. And uh, then once we were producing our own stuff, we're like looking for samples and just getting every record that costs 50 cents that exists. Like you go and, you, and you're listening, you're just listening through sometimes for straight samples, sometimes to be influenced like, oh, they're doing this, can we do something like that or whatever? And that's where we got our education. And 
so often it would just be all sorts of stuff and you're you know and then there's everybody is listening to stuff so you're trying to find something that they don't have and all of a sudden you're back to things that like you I you used to listen to things that your parents listened to all these things and I think really with with what is called hip hop that it's already a bending of genres mm -hmm. right and people don't think about it like that because somebody raps over the top of it right but uh, that's what, like, everybody, like, De La Soul and all of those things, that's what it was, was finding something that went into it. And I, I think, you know, early on, I was definitely very rigid, where, where even though you did that, it has to have this and it has to have that. And then, you know, we take so long promoting each record because every, every album was like a baby that by the time... I, we were ready to do another album. I was listening. I got caught up in some other kind of music. Hmm. And so it takes a while to not have that feeling like, oh, I'm not supposed to, that's, that's not what people want to hear or whatever you're thinking that. And then after a while you realize, okay, all you can do is the best you can bring is passion. Like you're hyped about this. You don't know why. It's just good to you. Mm. Right, and um, and and so that's kind of you know what it is for me. For, with film, I think it's also mixed with this works. Like, I want to get people. I, I don't want people to be too comfortable. I don't, I want to pe keep people on their toes. Uh, it's interesting. I I, I uh, just to, to, to develop more of a relationship with Guillermo del Toro, I, I wrote an episode of uh, Cabinet of Curiosities. And um, I just wanted to see like what that was, what, what is he doing, and you know, it's a lot of back and forth with him. And it, we, I didn't do it because I did I'm a Virgo instead. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and uh, but a lot of, you know, it's, you know, we were going back and forth with things and, um, you know, and, and at one point we got to an ending and he was like, Boots, you are the Rube Goldberg of cinema. <laughs> and, and I don't know whether it was a compliment or not, <laughs> but he was like, this is a horror show, so when this happens, we go here. And I'm like, well, I know that's what it normally does, but you know, I don't wanna go there. And he's like, no, nope, these are the rules that we're playing in. Like this, this is the, and so there is something to that. There's something to, you know, doing a waltz and playing inside those rules, mm. right? And something very masterful about that. Um, uh, for, so, so that's why I was interested in doing that. But for me, uh, because I'm, I'm very interested in that feeling that, that happens when it's something that you don't expect, where you feel like this new world is coming, that for, for me, that means not adhering to genre, mm. right? To, to not adhering to the rules. I mean, I think we did that even on our first album. I was telling you, like, our first single was a song uh, where the rapping doesn't start till about a minute and 20 seconds in, and it has no chorus, right? Um, which is called Not Yet Free. And um, it was, you know, the label was like, oh, you know, well, how about on the album if we have a song with choruses? <laughs> and we were like, fuck that, we're not selling out. <laughs> not doing it. And, uh, you know, after experimenting with seeing what people were into and seeing what they reacted to, this next album we did choruses. <laughs> but, it, uh, but, but I think similarly, what I was trying to do then was to do a thing that, that you're not expecting because I want to keep it alive. I want to do the, and, and I think that comes with, you know, I'm not purposely mixing genre. I'm not saying, oh, I'm gonna take this thing. It's more like that works. When, when I uh, had written the scene 
that Danny Glover's character um, explains the white boy uh, to, to Cassius, I originally had said, well, okay, I'm just gonna talk about this thing that happens when you're there and, and it's gonna, and you know, it'll be funny cause he'll at the end, you know, do a nasally voice and it'll, I'll get somebody really funny to do it and it's gonna be this. And then as I was getting to it, I was like, well, that's kind of just telling people about this idea. And I realized I thought about my music and how I do things. And I was like, I want people to feel a thing, you know, like mm. even like as my music went on, our stuff got more rougher and distorted and it had to do with wanting to, to, to make people feel something in our shows, like kind of with this might be called a punk energy or something. So I was like, okay, why am I doing this thing that I, you know, uh, you know, that, that's already there. How do I make somebody feel something? And I was like, okay, what's the feeling? And the feeling is this feeling of being disembodied, this feeling that something is off and wrong. And so that's when I was like, okay, so he'll be uh, overdubbed and we'll know it's an overdub. And then I was like, okay, well, but it's only going to work if we know that they think it's over an overdub that mm. they do this. So that's when I, I sat, I thought about it for a day. I was like, okay, is this, is this where I'm going? Is it, cause I hadn't even had the, I went back afterward and put the, the crashing desks in. So up until that point, it had been just like, a political workplace comedy maybe, you know? And so I, I was like, okay, no, this, this works, this does a thing. And so it's more like, I, I'm not, setting out to mix genres. I'm not setting out to do something absurd. I'm just doing the thing that I think works to make people's heart beat in a certain way mm. at a certain time. It makes me think about something else that you've said before, which is that film asks or answers the wrong questions. Yeah. What are some of the right questions? Well, I think also what I was saying at that time was kind of uh, paraphrasing um, stuff that Ben Davis had said in, in a, a small book called 9.5 Theses on Art and Class. And um, he, was, he had all these sorts of examples about um, and, uh, uh, disheartening examples of people doing uh, art with the intention of having it uh, connect to a movement. And, uh, you know, uh, he had an example of the Tropicalia movement, which I hadn't even understood as being uh, anti, uh, a anti dictator in Brazil and how those folks ended up selling it out uh, and renouncing it so that they didn't have to live in England. And then had an example of a of a of an artist uh, that did a gallery show in the early 2000s in uh, New York, where it was a installation that had dead bodies lying all around, and um, and you're supposed to walk through it, and it's an anti-war installation. That was his stated thing, right? Making you see the horrors of war, you know, you'll become anti-war. And anti-war organizers at the time said, well, I wish he would have talked to us because everybody's anti-war. They just don't think there's something they can do about it, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that people don't, aren't thoroughly horrified, it's that they don't think there's something they can do about it. And so I think the statement was, that you know, if you're not being part of a movement, if you're not actually organizationally joining something and, and with the intention of having a material change happen, you're not going to understand the questions that people are having. You're not gonna understand what might answer those questions. You're going to 
be affected by the result that we see on of, of the explanation of those questions that we just maybe see on the media or social media, and that's not really going to be the thing. And so we won't answer, we won't ask or answer the right questions. And so I think the, the right answer, uh, because there would be a lot of them, I think it would be found from joining and joining organizations. That the right answer for the right question for uh, artists to ask will be found from joining organizations that are actually uh, organizing a, around leveraging power to to uh, gain material changes, and you end up realizing right away it ends up changing your perspective on the art that you're making, I think. So, you know, uh, we've gotten, I, I've, we've gotten uh, panned sometimes for the Coos music being too happy, right? Like we'll talk about all these things, but it's very much the keys are often major and we're like getting people to dance and all that kind of stuff. And part of that is connected to my experience that I don't think people being angry makes them want to do anything. Mm. I think people being hopeful that there's a way to change it is what makes them want to do something. And so I try to make stuff that is hopeful. I might miss at it, but that's my intention, you know? And, um, and, and so I think the right answers and questions are very particular and they come from people actually being part of, uh, part of movements, mm -hmm. part of organizations to be clear. Mm. When you think about your approach to your filmmaking especially, because like with Sorry to Bother You, you originally wanted Richard Ayoade to direct it and then you chose to direct it yourself. And with I'm a Virgo, you did all of that yourself. How has this, two sort of questions in one, how has hope sort of driven the work that you've done in these spaces? And how has your relationship to the directing of it changed? Well, I think Making all these things takes a lot of effort. Takes a lot of, you know, um, struggle to do. You know, whether it's through the music that I did for many years, and even as it was getting bigger, there definitely, in those cases, there weren't wasn't a financial payoff. The, but the payoff was that I thought that my work was getting out there and being used in ways that helped various uh, organizations and movements. And that was the, 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 that was my reason, that hope, like that, that I, what I was doing was, was, was helping others to change things. And with the film business, now it, it does pay me something. So, um, but, even then, obviously my motivation hasn't been to get paid because I've, you know, I'm always uh, ready to walk away from that if it, if it doesn't make me feel that the work I'm doing is helping, it is, has a possibility of, of, of helping the movements that, that need to grow, to grow. So I think it's always, the hopefulness has always been there. That's the only reason that I kept doing it. Like, that's the only reason that, um, yeah, that, that I, you know, uh, that, that, that I'm, you know, that I don't have a job at the airport right now. Like, mm. um, it's, yeah, that, that's, so, so hopefulness, hope, and I guess hope is a very vague thing that could mean a lot of things. It could mean like faith or something, but that's not what I mean. It, it, 
you know, this idea that I can see the steps that, that can happen to lead to, um, to lead to a radical movement that could become revolutionary. Um, those are the things that I'm, that I hold on to for that. And, the, and, and at times when I don't, it makes me not want to make anything. And that, that the first time I think that I came to that was, um, I think just very recently, like, you know, and, and I got over that, but that was the first time I had that sort of like um, despair um, was just very recently, like, okay, now I'm making all of these things and I'm wanting to see how I could connect it to other radical movements and parties and, um, you know, and, and at, at a certain point I was like feeling like maybe, you know, I had been in this, had separated myself so much from all of that that I don't, and, and honestly like over the past like 10 years, there's been so many dissolution of organizations over like this little disagreements, maybe they're not little, but disagreements that shouldn't break up a revolutionary party that should just make them uh, restructure in some way. Um, and so a lot of those things that, that existed have been, you know, have, have like broken up and it's kind of more of a, is, is th those breakups are, are, are maybe connected to a lack of, of hope, a vision that there is something that could come. And, um, and so like feeling like, okay, well, uh, who's gonna be able to use this? And so I think, uh, so I was feeling like that and that was just recently. And I think obviously also brought on by the uh, feeling of powerlessness that has been happening over uh, over oh, with that that comes from people getting excited that they may be able to do something to stop a genocide and um, seeing you know how much work needs to be done to connect it to uh, ways we have to be powerful. And so, yeah, I, so when I feel that way, then I don't feel like maybe I shouldn't even be making anything. So I, I feel like that. So if you, to the extent that you've seen any work from me, it's only been because I do see a way forward. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for telling me, Kate, because I have a million questions that I could have kept asking you. At some point, I might email and pick your brain about things. But we'll start off with the Slido. Um, and then as people have questions in the audience, if you want to come up to one of the two microphones, you may do that. One of the first questions that pops up here is, how hard has it been for you to get funding for your films as an activist and creator? I mean, uh after the first one, not hard at all. But, uh, you know, the first one, I, I had not made any movies. Uh, I went to a couple years of film school, which I didn't add the couple years when I was trying to raise money. I just said I went to film school. And, um, yeah, and I co-directed one video. So that was... That was, that was hard. That was more like stone soup. Like being like, I got this person on board. Blah, blah. And, it, and it took seven years from writing the script to starting to, to, to actually make it. So that was pretty hard. And, and it really had to do with what I learned on how to build up hype. And so we built up a lot of hype. And a uh, big turning point was getting it to, uh, 
to Dave Eggers at McSweeney's. He published it uh, as its own paperback book and sent it around with the uh, McSweeney's Quarterly. And then I was like, I need to get, a f get the word filmmaker behind my name. And so I went to meet with SF Film to become a filmmaker in residence. I felt like if I could do that, then I could talk to people. And they were very uh, skeptical. If you're a rapper with a script, people are like, yeah, of course you want to make a film. You want to make, uh, you want a, a clothing line and you want a restaurant. You know, that's what they, they don't think you're serious about it. But I was having the meeting with them trying to get in and I was in, in San Francisco having the meeting with them and a black SUV pulls up. And the window rolls down and somebody says, Boots Riley. And I look and it's Dave Chappelle. And, and he says, I got a show tonight. You got to come, blah, 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 this and that. And I was like, okay, I'll be there. And then the woman that was running SF Film, at the time she was there, and she was like, was that Dave Chappelle? I was like, yeah, he says he's going to be in the movie. And, you know, which he wasn't. And that's things like that. There was a lot of lying that happened. But... After we made a movie uh, for four million dollars that made a lot more money, then that was, it hasn't been hard yet, but at some point it will get be hard again. Hmm. Well, we've got some people up at the microphones here. I don't know who looks first. Okay, so we'll start with your question. Well, yeah, I choose it all. Uh, why do you think Cootie is a devaluation? No one wants Cootie, sir. <laughs> uh, my father's name was Cootie yeah. as a kid. Oh, yes. Really? It's a very common black name. Like a nickname or his name? Nickname. Okay. That the parents call you. And you know why his name was Cootie? Because Cootie, Bootsy, all those things that are thought of as country and thought of by many people as too black are actually African terms of endearment. K-U-T-I, Fela Kuti, is a, is a term of endearment that came through West Africa that people in slavery still call their, their kids. Kuti, Bootsy, and there's all sorts of names. I mean, uh, there's a filmmaker named Kuti. Why? Because the family calls me that. People don't uh, necessarily put it on their birth certificate. But I think there are a lot of people, like my father didn't, once he became an adult, didn't want anybody to know that that had been his name. Uh, not because he thought it was the cooties, but because it seemed uh, like something that, that, that was for a kid, right? And, or thought of as not re as respectful. But then when, when I had found that that's where it came from, then all of a sudden he, he got proud about it, right? And the reason that Kuti and Bootsy were thought of as less than is only because they're associated with black people's nicknames in terms of endearment for that. And most people, the, 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 the Kuti's is something that was not, something that people had when they thought of the nickname. That's more recent for, for black folks to think of cooties in that way. Yeah. Scat, that's what, there's, there's a lot of people called that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right. Have you? you ever heard of Scat Man Crothers? Okay. All right. Oh, thank you. How do I figure out which medium? What, how do I figure out which medium is the best way to convey yeah. it? Yeah. 
Between, say it again, between which mediums? Uh, between film, activis acti activism, and music. Oh. I kind of just do what I can do, right? <laughs> and I, you know, I did music for a long time and hopefully we'll make some again, but it, you know, I had kind of gotten to where I could get without an infusion of cash, which wasn't gonna come around in a, in a little while. And so, meaning like as big as I could, we, we did a lot of stuff and I think also I kind of got to a point where, yeah, I just felt like it was near, nearing the limits of what I could do with music as a self, in, in my case, I think someone could do something really big and massive with it, but we had gotten there. So that was that. Film, I had the, I've had the most effective response from it, like so w during that, that wave of strikes when it was at its peak in 2020, 2021, I was getting dozens of messages from people that were like saying, we were we we were organizing our you know workplace our you know s the supermarket we work at the blah 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 and we were unsure whether people were going to join the strike but so we showed sorry to bother you <laughs> and all of a sudden everybody was down to strike <laughs> and um, I got to, I, when I went to Baltimore somebody had told me a story about like there was like. 80 people um, going to vote on whether to create their own union. And uh, the guy was, th was one of the organizers. And he also didn't know where it was going to go. It could have gone any way. And um, right before, there was going to be a show of hands. And right before everybody was to show their hands, uh, somebody yelled out, Equisapiens, let's be out. <laughs> And everybody raised their hands. And so hearing those stories, I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is like a, a realization of, of uh, my art connecting to folks. So I don't really, it's, 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 it's more like, okay, I have an idea, this is what this can do. And the music is something I'll do, but it, it also just takes more. I was supposed to write one song per episode for I'm a Virgo and just didn't, w wasn't able to find the time to do it. You know? Yeah. Um, are you working on anything right now? Yeah, we're in prep for a movie right now uh, that, that uh, takes place in the world of professional shoplifting. <laughs> and... Uh, it's called I Love Boosters, and it, uh, it's Kiki Palmer, Naomi Aki, Demi Moore. Let me figure out what's been announced already that we can say. And Lakeith Stanfield. That's awesome. Thank you yeah. All right. for your time. Sorry, I'm very short. Um, I thought you were sorry to bother you was astonishing. I'm, I was active with the Progressive Labor Party in New York City in the 1960s. I'm still, I'm with the Freedom Socialist Party, which is a socialist feminist party, and I want to give you two of our newspapers, and I'm putting them right there on the stage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One of them says, the working class needs a party of its own, the other one says, billionaire donors and the politicians they own. A sub is $5 if you want to talk to me. <laughs> oh, one other thing. I know it's a hard, really tall order, but it'd be wonderful if you could make a movie that would make joining a communist party popular. <laughs> well, I will say that we had the first thing, I don't know, TV or major movie where someone says, I'm a communist, and it's supposed to be a good thing. So, I'm, I'm a Virgo, so. Over here. How you doing? All right. Yeah, uh, we was in a cypher a few years ago. We were here in Seattle. 
It was a joint called Love City Love. It was on the corner. Love City Love. Uh, you were cool. Um, I liked your movies. I like your pacing. I like the tone and the temperature. Those are really cool. I'm a script writer. I'm writing and I got 20 pages in. Right. I'm also an MC and I'm also part of the Mojo Fest, a grassroots organization. So I feel you. Thank I hear you. Um, my question, not to detract, but the current state of the culture of hip hop as it is now with regard to, in my opinion, uh, the APAC controlled honeypot, no Diddy, that deals with Diddy. We as artists, shouldn't we look at this as an opportunity to fill the gap that this ripple is causing? It's, it's, it's not hip hop, but he affects the masses that hear it. It affects the practitioners that participate in the expression of their art. And like, yeah, we didn't like Ray Gunn, but she made a ripple at the Olympics. And Diddy is making a ripple somewhere. What, what do you mean by what, making What should we do as artists when he's gone? Or should we continue to stand at the gate and let people go in or gatekeep? Gatekeep. Should we gatekeep the culture? Um, well, I guess one, w w one thing that I would say is um, the entertainment industry, like most industries in the United States, are controlled by the white guys that run it. And it's, it's, you know, there's this idea that you said, like, that it was controlled by... So, 4,080 4, regular executives are shady, period. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but so, yeah, it's, I would just say most of them are just straight white that run it, but they are not, they are in the ruling class, so they're not white people uh, ju in general. Um, but what I would say is this, how do you gatekeep uh, under capitalism if you have no power. So the idea that we can gatekeep or control a culture, when culture, culture is decided by material factors, right? You do, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It comes from people, but the people that create it, they create what they create based on how they survive. Culture is a product of us figuring out how to survive. So, you know, you could have, you, you could have a, um, you could have a village that's by the river. And you're like, this is a fishing village, but really it should be agricultural. And you're like, you know what? Let's make a bunch of songs that talk about agriculture and how they should sow the seeds and all this kind of stuff. And matter of fact, if you're really good, you could probably make something that people want to dance to and sing over and over about sowing seeds and tilling the soil. But if there's a river bot nearby and that's how they make their living, they're gonna change it into a fishing song. It's gonna have all the same notes, everything but it's gonna be about how to put the hook on the, the worm and how to stay out there late to get the, the fish and so all that kind of stuff. do for self, do so for self, it's or not, do for community? Huh? Do for self or do for community in terms I'm of I'm saying that we, to not sound like a broken record, we need a mass, militant, radical labor movement that grows into a uh, more radical revolutionary movement until we control the material uh, basis of the economy, we won't have control over the culture. DJs own oil plants. We have time for only two more questions, and I want to make sure I go back to the Slido so that there's a representation of people on here as well. Another question. I'll that you try to answer them faster so we can get more. <laughs> in. Another question you got was how do you balance creating politically driven content? with navigating capitalist media distributors? And are there alternatives to getting one's art seen? 
Uh, currently, there's no alternative to capitalism. <laughs> and we're not going to get away from capitalism by creating. I mean, you, I think there's ways to survive that, that, are, that are alternative scenes that help things happen. But let's be clear, those are capitalist scenes, right? They might be necessary and helpful, but it's, there's, there's no way to like hide from capitalism. The only way to get rid of it is to get rid of it. And, um, and, and that takes a class struggle. Um, so from the beginning, the only reason anybody knows who I am here, even if you know us from our first album, is because we worked with multi-billion dollar companies and we got it out there. I, had a, I remember a talk that I had with Jello Biafra and, and uh, I, I asked him one time, like I didn't know much about punk and I was like, I don't know much about punk. He was like, let me tell you. And he told me the history, his history of punk for like three hours. <laughs> and, and within that, what I caught was uh, the name of a group that I did know about which was The Clash. And he was talking a lot of shit about The Clash. <laughs> and his point was they were on Columbia Records and they sold out. And I was like, but I knew about them and I didn't know about the Dead Kennedys. And I knew, and a lot of people knew about them and a lot of people got inspired by them and that's, what needs to happen because, you know, it's, it's not about, you know, there's no way to be the pure, I, I want, I don't want to collect the people that just already agree with me. I want to talk to everybody who doesn't care whether they're drinking a Coke or they're eating a McDonald's burger. I want them to organize on their job, and that's my, my point. Mm. Do you have time for one more, is that right? Okay. Um, I'll go. Okay, uh, so basically, <laughs> <laughs> when you made that album, when uh, you were blowing up the 9-11, the thing, the, the Twin Towers, remember that? So what was that, what was that like? Did you feel like you were, um, like manifesting something or tapping into something or was it just a coincidence? I don't really believe in the manifesting we do is with our hands, right? So I think what we did was talk about a thing that people were all talking about was where's the center of power? And, uh, you know, and, and we didn't want to blow up the White House because that was a cliche. And it also wasn't where the center of power is. So we wanted to talk about, uh, we wanted something that was more connected to finance. We went to Wall Street, we're gonna do that, but we realized a lot of people that look at our album cover wouldn't know that's Wall Street. So we did the Twin Towers because people knew what that was, but yeah. Okay. Real cool. quick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts as a revolutionary and an organizer on how the workers' movement and anti-imperialist movements can build cultural hegemony. Cultural what? Hegemony, um, you know, to build alternative cultural spaces against yeah. capitalism. White culture. I don't know if, the, is that the goal? To, uh, like, you know, like, I don't, I think maybe it's necessary to have, but I'm tired of talking to other people that agree with me. I want to, talk to people that, that I want to get, I think that's necessary to do that, but I want, I want to have culture that reaches the, the people that we need to be organizing. Um, and so if that's what you're, you're talking about, like alternative music spaces and other cultural I things. I guess I meant more so as you're saying, like how do we build like those vehicles to reach the broadest sections of working people? Yeah, trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I think we have to start with 
having, you know, you think about this. Um, I don't know the name of the book, fuck. But, it, but there, there's a book about how in the 1920s, there was this whole big debate uh, that where people like Charles Seeger, Pete Seeger's father, uh, was in, in the Communist Party, and they were saying classical music was the music to get to the people with, right? And because at the time, folk music was seen as, you know, bass and, you know, negative and, you know, not, quote unquote, political. And, uh, and, and the, the, what, what happened, these were a few of the people in the Communist Party leadership in New York, and that's what Charles Seeger and them kind of were part of. But there were people all over the country that the Communist Party was involved in, involved with, that said, what the fuck are you talking about? We can't sing that shit on a strike line, <laughs> right? We need music that at the time could be, you know, because even most people didn't have record players and stuff like that, right? So they developed what, and now we think of folk music as inherently almost political, right? Because this big movement that was created and it didn't come just from the few folks that were in New York, although Charles Seeger ended up obviously putting forward the idea of using folk music, but it came because they were already involved in all of these places. So their, the culture that they put forward was intertwined with the work that they were doing, right? So, we're, you know, at some point, the stuff that I'm doing is gonna hit a roadblock of where it gets promoted. The stuff that, you know, but what we need to do is we need to have these movements that are, you know, there needs to be both. We gotta make culture, but we, we need the material movements so that we have a place for the culture to go. And that will, that, that, that will spread it, that will, will, will connect it. We talk about also, all of this stuff is always connected to something material. Sometimes those material movements are very capitalist, but it's always connected to it. You talk about the funk and what was happening and, and soul. You talk about, then you think about places like Dayton, Ohio and Detroit. That was because people could go there to get money and work at a factory. And out of that came music that represented maybe some petty bourgeois ideas because of the petty bourgeois ideas that came from working at those factories. You, you think about right now, we're in Atlanta filming this thing and there's all these designers and music and, and basically they're following where the money is, where they can make, so, so what are we, we're not trying to promote something where it's just about making money. We're promoting something though that's about a material change, about people figuring out how they can collectively survive, figuring out how they can push back a thing, against things. When we create that culture, will, that, that's where we have our spaces to make the culture that, that grows and have our bases to jump from. And, and I'm being simplistic. That does, does that mean that somebody shouldn't create before that exists some, you know, a venue or some other space and do, no, they, they should. But it's not going to get where it goes until we are we are, we, are, we are creating movements that are connected to that material change and then the culture will be something that, that is able to grow from there. Thank you. Thank you for having me.